Hello, this is movie man Eric Houston with a special treat. This is one of my classic classes from our archives that I'm bringing back and posting here on YouTube for you to enjoy. This is monster movies of the 20s and 30s. The long history and tradition of monster movies stretches all the way back to the silent era, with one of the first and most memorable being Nosferatu, a symphony of terror from 1922. Nosferatu was directed by F.W. Marnow, who, in making the film, followed screenwriter Heinrich Galeen's script tightly. The script had included sketches and, to help Marnow along, and Marnow used a metronome on set to help control the pace of the acting. Marnell left Germany, where he made Nosferatu for Hollywood in 1926, where he made a number of acclaimed American films, including, given the ironically titled, given his association with Nosferatu, Sunrise. <laughs> Sunrise was one of the first films to feature a fully synchronized soundtrack, and it was the winner of the Best Unique and Artistic Picture Award at the first ever Academy Awards, a precursor to the Best Picture Oscar. It also won for Best Actress and Best Cinematography. Max Schreck stars in Nosferatu as Count Orlock. Schreck had acted in a number of German expressionist plays and films, and one of his friends described him as a loner with an unusual sense of humor and skill in playing grotesque characters. There was, for many years, a rumor that no photographs existed of Schreck outside of the Orlock makeup, but as you can see, that is at least no longer the case. German Expressionism, by the way, is a mode of art that emphasizes, well, Expressionism, that emphasizes the unreal with highly angular and surreal-looking surreal aesthetics. In the case of German Expressionist films, that particularly comes in the sets and the makeup. In Nosferatu, you can particularly see that in how they make up Orlok, where his face features all of these sharp angles, and he's such a sort of a tall and lean-looking figure. Other German Expressionist films include The Golem and, most famously, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. In this clip, you'll see 
see how that movie really takes German expressionism as far as the set design goes to real extremes, creating a very haunted, surrealist dreamscape for the movie to take place in. The movie, incidentally, is about a somnambulist who is being controlled by an evil doctor. As the sort of exemplars of the German Expressionist movement in film, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu especially would influence monster movies and horror movies for decades to come. And indeed, their influence can still be seen in films, particularly from Tim Burton, who heavily draws his own aesthetic from the German Expressionist influences. Nosferatu was filmed at a studio called Prana in Germany, which was founded by occultist Albin Grau, specifically to produce occult and supernatural films, but Nosferatu would be its only production. It appears to be the very first piece of vampire fiction of any sort where vampires are harmed by sunlight. The eerie gothic feel and Shrek's chilling performance would help to also set the template for future horror films. Now, Nosferatu is based very closely on Dracula, but with a number of small changes, such as changing the name of Dracula to Count Orlock. The reason for this is that Marnow and his, uh, and his colleagues wanted to produce a specific adaptation of Dracula, but in 1922, Dracula was still a relatively new novel and still produ protected by copyright. And they were unable to, they were either unable to get the license to make a Dracula movie or unwilling to pay the fees. Whatever the case, the Stoker estate, Bram Stoker had written Dracula, sued the makers of Nosferatu, sued Prana, and copies of the film were ordered destroyed after the court agreed that Nosferatu infringed on the Dracula copyright. Luckily, a few prints that were sent to countries like America survived to this day. However, as popular as Nosferatu and films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari were during the silent era, there was really only one name in horror, and that was Lon Chaney, the so-called man of a thousand faces. Born to deaf mute parents, Chaney took to silent screen acting like a fish to water. He had grown up knowing and learning how to use his hands and his face to express ideas and emotions, and that upbringing seemed to make him tailor-made to star in silent films. He gravitated very early on to unusual and grotesque sorts of characters in movies like The Penalty, where he plays a figure or a mob figure who has had both of his legs amputated below the knee. Here, he designed special cups that he put over the bottoms of his legs that bent his legs up behind him. The bent legs were hidden then by an elongated coat, and Cheney spent the entire movie walking around on his knees to simulate what it would have been like to have had both his legs amputated. He played a disturbing-looking clown in the movie He Who Gets Slapped and a vampiric killer in the now sadly lost film London After Midnight. Cheney did all of his own makeups, inventing them all himself. This was at a time where there weren't really makeup artists on movies where actors were expected to do their own, and Cheney really did help to make a name for himself by creating such outlandish and fantastic makeups, all from a fishing tackle box and using relatively mundane materials like tape and fishing line to achieve the dramatic looks of his characters. 
Universal Studios eventually hired Lon Chaney away from other studios he had been working at. Specifically, producer Carl Lemley wanted to bring Chaney to his studio and dared him to make his most horrific makeup yet for a pair of lavishly produced films, 1923's Hunchback of Notre Dame and 1925's Phantom of the Opera. Phantom makeup was in particular highly anticipated and kept a closely guarded secret on set. That scene, where Lon Chaney reveals himself as the Phantom, was supposedly the very first time that actress Mary Philbin saw the makeup, and her reaction is supposedly genuine. Both Hunchback and Phantom were enormous successes for Chaney and Universal. They were also badly needed successes for Universal. Carl Lemley, as a studio head, had long had a trouble with keeping movies under budget and bringing them in on time, and Universal's financial status was always in difficulty. Enormous hits like this helped him to keep the studio afloat, and he was eager to continue the collaboration with Chaney, intending for him to star in a new movie version of Dracula. In 1929, though, Chaney contracted pneumonia while filming a movie called Thunder. After that, he finished only one additional movie, his only sound film, a remake of his earlier silent picture, The Unholy Three. This film, in addition to introducing Chaney to the world of sound, was intended to introduce him as the man not only of a thousand faces, but a man of a thousand voices, expanding his talents in that way into the sound film medium. As such, Chaney plays a man who disguises himself as an old woman doing different voices for both, and who is also a ventriloquist, often offering voices for different characters and throwing his voice to be the sounds of animals and things like that. In the tree, but you don't remember anything else except that you were on some mysterious farm in the country. Yes, in short, Mrs. O'Grady, you don't remember anything else except what you want to remember, do you? Oh, I had such a headache. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Grady, if you have a headache, I... Thank you. I didn't mean to make you nervous. Oh, it's much better now. Thank you. You see, I'm only attempting to drive the truth. Yes, of course. Now, uh, Mrs. O'Grady. <laughs> see you, Your Honor. Order! Order in the court! What is the meaning of this? Your Honor, I wish to make a full confession. 
Cheney lost his fight with pneumonia not long after the completion of the Unholy Three, and he passed away in 1929. All of the studios and offices at MGM, where Cheney had made a number of his greatest triumphs, observed two minutes of silence, and a Marine chaplain and honor guard were present for his funeral. Cheney had formed a special bond with the Marines after starring as a tough drill sergeant in the movie Go Tell It to the Marines, and had been adopted as not just a mascot, but an honorary Marine by the Corps, who represented him at his funeral. In 1930, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. After Cheney's death, plans to continue with Dracula and other movies, monster movies at Universal were put on the back burner, not surprisingly, at least until 1931, when Carl Lemley Jr., the son of Carl Lemley, became the head of production. Actually, he'd become the head of production in 1928 at the age of 20, and he in particular was known for spending too much money on films that didn't gross nearly enough sort of taking after his father in that regard. In fact, he was so unsuccessful in the job that he and his father would have to sell the studio in 1936, and neither of them would ever work in movies again. Still, amongst the films that had worked for Universal were those two Cheney monster pictures. And so Carl Jr. decided to try and convince his father that they should once again get into the monster movie business and to finally release a film version of Dracula. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. spider spinning his web for the unwary fly. The blood is the light, Mr. Renfield. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was the first officially licensed version of the novel Dracula, which had been written in 1897 by Bram Stoker. However, the movie would, instead of taking its inspiration from the novel itself, was largely based on a 1927 Broadway stage version of the novel. Producers studied Nosferatu in depth for their version of Dracula. Ironic, because, of course, Nosferatu had been sort of an unlicensed version of Dracula, even essentially replicating specific scenes that existed only in Nosferatu and not in either the Dracula novel or the play, such as the scene when Renfield pricks his finger on a paperclip. Here's the scene as it appeared in Nosferatu. find this comfortable. Thanks. It looks very inviting. Ouch. Oh, it's nothing serious, just a small cut from that paper clip. It's 
just a scratch. The film was directed by frequent Lon Chaney collaborator and silent film director Todd Browning, with Dracula being his very first sound film. That, combined with the use of the Broadway play as inspiration, helps to explain the more histrionic style of acting seen in the film. This was still very early in the sound era, and both the director and many of the actors were used to either stage acting or silent film acting. A red mist spread over the lawn, coming on like a flame of fire. And then he parted it. And I could see that there were thousands of rats with their eyes blazing red, like his, only smaller. And then he held up his hand, and they all stopped. And I thought he seemed to be saying, Rats, 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 thousands, millions of them, all red blood, all these will I give you, if you will obey me. Personally, I think this style of acting, along with a number of the other kind of silent film elements of the movie, helped to give the whole thing a really effective otherworldliness. A big part of that, of course, is the performance offered by Bela Lugosi, and the lead is Dracula. Bela was a Hungarian native born in 1882 who had played Dracula in that very Broadway play that we'd mentioned to solid reviews. However, he was not wanted for the film. Lemley Sr. did not like Lugosi, and Browning was more interested in an off-screen threat, so a version of Dracula where you wouldn't even see Dracula. Still, Bela happened to be in town with the touring company of that Broadway play, and he lobbied Lemley Sr. for the role in the movie. He ended up having to agree to accept a mere $3,500 for his work on the film. He would play Dracula only one other time as he was afraid of being typecast, but would end up appearing in several other monster movies as his career began to wane, including The Wolfman, The Ghost of Frankenstein, and Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, where he played the Frankenstein monster. He also often appeared later in his career alongside fellow monster legend Boris Karloff, but was always second build. Unfortunately, Lugosi had a long career of not getting along well with studio heads and was often reportedly somewhat difficult to work with. During his day, though, he was also something of a sex symbol and was very popular with audiences. Dracula was an enormous hit, just the sort of hit that Universal Studios was looking for, and they were eager to follow it up with another monster movie. How do you do? Mr. Carl Emily feels it would be a little unkind to present this picture without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image, without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to, uh, well, we've warned you. Following the success of Dracula, Lugosi expected to star as Dr. Frankenstein, but Lemley wanted him to star as the monster. Lugosi didn't really like the idea and ended up leaving the project following a series of disastrous makeup tests. At the time, they had yet to conceive of the iconic 
Frankenstein makeup. Additionally, the script that was presented to Lugosi was an early draft that had no pathos for the monster, presenting him instead as an inhuman killing machine. Lugosi said, I was a star in my country, and I will not be a scarecrow over here. Sympathy for the monster is a huge part of what makes these Frankenstein movies work, and Lugosi knew that. Fortunately, eventually, the producers realized it too, particularly after they hired director James Whale to helm the project. Whale was an English director who, like Browning, was very influenced by German expressionism. Lemley had wanted him to come and work at Universal and gave him his choice of films, and he chose Frankenstein. He would direct many movies over many genres over his long career, including an award-winning version of Showboat, but he is known mostly for his horror output, which he did sort of resent, and movies like Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and The Bride of Frankenstein. Additionally, Whale was openly gay, which was highly unusual for the time. And he, along with the Lemleys, eventually selected Boris Karloff to star as the monster. Would you like one of my flowers? You have those, and I'll have these. I can make a boat. See how mine floats? Karloff, who brought a lot of that necessary pathos to his version of the monster, a, a largely mute role, was born William Henry Pratt. The origin of his stage name is unclear, except that he apparently changed it to protect his brothers, all British diplomats, from embarrassment. Ironically, his brothers were very proud of Boris, particularly once he gained fame for playing Frankenstein, and liked to brag to their friends and colleagues that their brother was the famous actor. Karloff was known for playing the Frankenstein monster, the mummy, and also the Grinch. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Oh, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Frankenstein was Karloff's 81st movie. He had starred really only in small roles before, but Frankenstein catapulted him to enormous fame, with horror quickly becoming his genre, and he became very famous in it, arguably much more so than Lugosi, in no small part because Karloff was easier to get along with and more willing to play ball with promotion, such as when he put on the makeup to, to play in this charity baseball game as the Frankenstein monster. Incidentally, in this photograph, you can see silent film star Buster Keaton as the catcher. Immediately after this photo was taken, Karloff hit a home run, and Keaton supposedly fainted dead away 
having just seen the Frankenstein monster, hit a homer. Karloff would also lend his name and likeness to numerous comic books and novels later in life, helping to keep himself and his face prominent with his fans. Karloff was also one of the 21 founding members of the Screen Actors Guild, and he became inspired to take up the cause of fair wages and fair treatment of actors after the long hours he had to spend in the makeup chair on Frankenstein without suitable compensation. That makeup was created by Jack B. Pierce, a Greek in immigrant who had had numerous jobs in the movie industry, but began to specialize in makeup after, after the death of Lon Chaney. He created the makeup for the Monkey Man in The Monkey Talks and Conrad Veet's legendary makeup in The Man Who Laughs, which itself was supposedly an inspiration for the comic book character, The Joker. Cheney's death really opened the door for Pierce as suddenly the movies needed someone who could specialize in these sorts of outlandish makeups. The Frankenstein makeup took four hours to apply each day and was very uncomfortable. Each of the shoes required for the role weighed 11 pounds each. Pierce was a crusty man himself, somewhat difficult to get along with, but he and Karloff got along famously, which made their work together that much, and long hours together, that much easier. It took us about four hours in the morning to <laughs> put the Frankenstein face and the head on for us. And nearly Jack. an hour to take it off. <laughs> yes. The whole outfit weighed about 20, 35 pounds. Yeah, you know who that is, Boris. That's One of the leading makeup Jack artists Pierce. in motion pictures who flew down here from Angel's Camp, California, where he's working on the Ransom Broidy production, Bullwhip, your very good friend, Jack Pierce. Yeah. <laughs> yes, oh, the oh, best you. makeup man in the world. Ah, what Thank what you. Is, Thank I you. owe him a lot. Thank you. Boris, I have little of remembrance for the monster that you have portrayed. And I think this will remember the days we worked day and night oh, to create it. Tell them what it is. Right on the day. That's the little uh, the, that's the <laughs> electric lot to d connect electricity. I used to call it the alamite. Alamite. <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, uh, Boris had to work in that heavy outfit all day, every day for, oh, how many weeks? Uh, 18 weeks. 18 weeks, that right. And Boris. Karloff even collaborated with Pierce on the monster's look by removing a dental plate from his mouth, which helped to give the creature's face the famous caved-in appearance. Pierce would also do Karloff's makeup for The Mummy and other films throughout his career. Universal quickly recognized just how iconic the Frankenstein monster makeup was and quickly copyrighted it, allowing them to continue to make money off of various products with its likeness and to prevent rival studios from making their own Frankenstein pictures with similar looking monsters. One of the other great successes of that version of Frankenstein were the electrical effects from the creation scene. These were considered to be a particularly big success with audiences and would be considered a necessity for every Frankenstein sequel that followed thereafter, as well as many of Universal's other monster movies. These elaborate devices were created by a man named Kenneth Strickfadden and supposedly included a coil built by Nikola Tesla himself. Frankenstein was an enormous success for Universal, even more so than Dracula, and made $1.4 million at a time when ticket sales were so cheap that that meant that roughly 15 million people went to see Frankenstein in movie theaters. They followed the success of Frankenstein with The Mummy in 1932, a film which combines elements of Frankenstein and Dracula in its sort of immortal love story about, a, about an Egyptian, I don't think he's a pharaoh, um, but an Egyptian priest who had been mummified and has now been brought back to life in the modern day, seeking the reincarnation of his lost love. The film was also inspired in part by the so-called Curse of King Tut's Tomb, 
wherein 11 people who had been present at the opening had died within 10 years of the tomb's discovery. And while it certainly wasn't an actual curse, the deaths were largely unrelated from each other, it still was something that had hyped media attention, along with the discovery of Tut's tomb itself, to get audiences very excited about the idea of mummies. <laughs> These films were so successful for Universal that's no surprise that other studios were also interested in creating their own monster movies. One person interested in making monster movies was Marion C. Cooper an ex-Air Force officer and adventurer who got his start in movies by filming nature documentaries. One night, Cooper dreamt of a giant gorilla terrorizing New York City. Cooper took his dream to RKO and his friend, RKO Vice President David Selznick, who agree that there's something to this idea and hire Cooper to make a movie. Cooper would co-direct this movie with a man named Ernest Shodzak. Cooper would direct the jungle action scenes, while Shodzak would direct the scenes on the boat and in the villages. Cooper resisted studio suggestions early on to introduce the gorilla right at the start of the movie and rather wanted to hold off the character's inter introduction until well in to help establish mood. He ended up naming the film and the creature, of course, King Kong. King Kong would go through a number of writers, none of them able to bring Cooper's dream to life until it was finished by a woman named Ruth Rose, who was actually Shodzak's wife. Ruth had never written a film script before, but she understood Cooper and knew what he wanted better than most of the other writers. Part of what she did to appeal to Cooper was to include the Carl Denham character, a director based on Cooper, in the script to sort of appeal to Cooper's vanity, and well, it worked with Rose's version of the film being the final version we see on the screen. Faye Ray stars, of course, in the film. She had starred in Eric von Stroheim's sil classic silent film, The Wedding March, and it appeared in two earlier films for Cooper, The Four Feathers and The Most Dangerous Game. She beat out stiff competition to star in King Kong that included Gene Harlow and Ginger Rogers. She, to be frank, didn't really care for the script or the story, but really appreciated Cooper's enthusiasm and felt that that, more than anything else, would make for a successful project.
the effect, the spectacular effects in King Kong were created by a number of men, including Marcel Delgado, who sculpted Kong and made four versions of the monster, including two 18-inch puppets that were made out of aluminum, foam rubber, latex, and rabbit fur. He also made a 24-inch version for the New York scenes and a small model of lead and fur for falling off of the Empire State Building. There was also a huge bust of Kong's head and neck that was controlled by three men who were needed to control the mouth and facial expressions. This version featured 10 inch long fangs and 12 inch diameter eyes. Willis O'Brien then did the actual animating of the stop motion Kong and his hands on Kong's fur created the unintentional ripple effect on his fur. The T-Rex fight alone took seven weeks to create and featured Willis's ideas of how animals should act. When he was animating Kong, Willis was very careful not to make Kong appear too human, but wanted to include little touches to help emphasize that he was in fact a wild animal. The business at the end of the clip where Kong plays with the defeated T-Rex jaw is a perfect example of the sort of expressions that Willis was trying to give to make Kong appear more wild and animalistic. King Kong premiered appropriately enough in New York City at the Radio City Music Hall, and the premiere was so successful that the RKO had to rent out a second theater across the street to handle the enormous crowds. Every one of 10 shows a day were sold out over the first four days of Kong's release. It set an all-time attendance record for an indoor event at the time and made $2 million, half a million more than Frankenstein. This is at a time, remember, when tickets cost just 35 to 75 cents. The film was so successful that RKO rewarded Cooper by making him their production head from 1933 to 1934. In 1935, Universal was still making monster movies and seeing the enormous success of King Kong wanted something great to rival it. And they felt like their best bet at an enormous monster movie would be with a sequel to Frankenstein and began producing The Bride of Frankenstein. Whale would return to direct, having just had great success with The Invisible Man in 1933. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> Look, he's all eaten away. Huh? How do you like that, eh? <laughs> Bride of Frankenstein, unfortunately, was not a terribly successful movie. Whale didn't think that he could match the success of the original Frankenstein and sought to make his sequel more of a hoot and sort of a campy film to differentiate it from the original. And now for our lesson. Remember, this is bread. Bread. Mm. Bread. Huh. Mm. And this is wine. To drink. 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 Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good. Uh -huh. Good. Mm. 
We are friends, you and I. Friends. Friends. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> and now, for a smoke. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is good. Smoke. You try. Oh. <laughs> good, good. Audiences simply weren't ready for this much sillier and campier take on the character. And as a result, like I said, the film was a failure and such a failure that it contributed to the sale of Universal away from the Lemleys. The new leadership decided it didn't want to be involved in the monster movie business anymore and ceased making monster movies at Universal. There and then, it seemed that the monster fad might be over for good, but of course, we know better. I hope you enjoyed this look at monster movies of the 20s and 30s. If you did, please like this video, comment, or subscribe to the Movie Man Eric YouTube channel. You can also send me an email at eric at northmetrotv.com. Your likes and comments and emails and subscriptions all help, to be a help me to be able to keep doing these classes and posting them here on YouTube for you to enjoy for free. So please do that. Otherwise, have a great night. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.